We're talking today with Lyndon Ameny of Spring Lake, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, we're doing something a little bit different from normal here because we're actually talking about uh, Linda's mother, who was Evelyn Tolly Buckingham, uh, who served in the United States Air Force. Um, she's no longer with us, but she wrote an account of her story, and Linda knows a good deal about it. Uh, so we are going to put that story together with a combination of Linda's memories and what her mother wrote. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing your mother did not write about was anything about her life really before going into the Air Force. So uh, yes. let's begin at the beginning. Uh, where and when was she born? She was born in Madison, South Dakota, and just think Little House on the Prairie. Uh, she was, uh, her father was a farmer, had lots of property um, outside of Madison. She grew up during the Depression, but she said she never felt the, the, effect, the effects of the Depression because her mother was an awesome seamstress, so her mother always made, you know, clothes out of the, um, the, uh, burlap bags and, and such and they always had food because they lived on the farm and weren't really connected to the to the city. Madison is only about 4,000 people. Okay. Now did they own their farm? Yes they did. Okay. Yes. And were they yeah. able to keep that through the 30s? Uh, no actually the bank did take it over for about 10 years. Um, it used to belong to my great-grandfather and then he lost it and it went back to the bank but my grandfather continued to farm it, and then he purchased it back from the bank after those 10 years. Okay. So it's been, in the, it's been in the family about 100 years now. Okay, so there's still a family member who's yes. farming it now? Okay, yes. Uh -huh. that. Yeah. All right. Uh, and what kind of schooling did she have? She went to a one-room schoolhouse until she was about eighth grade, and she said it was, um, she loved the learning because she was the only student in her class and so many times the teacher would say you know Evelyn come sit in with the you know the next oldest class mm -hmm. and come sit in with us and so she learned to love to read and she used to read the dictionary at night um, because it was just something mm -hmm. fun learning new words and such so she was at a one-room schoolhouse until um, high school and then she went in town the one-room schoolhouse was only a mile away from where her farm was. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then after, for high school, she went in town to a regular high school. Okay, and how far was that from home? It was about three miles. Okay. And I'm not sure how she got there. Uh, she had another sister. Uh, she was number three out of four children. Mm -hmm. She had another sister who was two and a half years older. So I'm not sure whether her sister Shirley drove them into town. I'm sure they didn't walk into town because okay. it was all country. So it wasn't wa 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 walking you know, ten, 10 miles to school. Oh, kind of thing no, definitely to the one room schoolhouse. It was blizzards and it was uphill both ways and mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> all right. Now, did she tell any stories about uh, life during World War II? I mean, she would have been still in school at that point. Yes. Um, she wanted to go into service and that's what makes her story so to me so unique is that she wanted to go into the service. She wanted to serve her country. She wanted to see the world and she wanted to go into the Air Force because there was the capability of going all over the world. So when she graduated from high school she wanted to go into the service but at that time um, she had to be 21 to go in on her own. Uh, graduating at 18 she would need her parents permission and they would not sign for her. Okay. So but I guess I was asking a little bit about before that when she was still younger, but when, when World oh, War II was going on, did she kind of say anything about what life was like there or talk about rationing or anything else like that? No, she, well, she never felt those effects mm -hmm. because she lived on a farm. Right. And uh, my grandpa got extra rationings for, for fuel right. because he was a farmer. Um, she just didn't feel, mm -hmm. she just didn't feel the rationings part of it. Um, she just always said that she, she wanted to do something for her country. She okay. wanted to serve her country. And you don't really have a sense of exactly when that feeling started for her? Um, late high school. I know that when okay. she graduated from high school, she wanted to go into the service, mm -hmm. but Grandma and Grandpa said no. Okay. What year did she finish high school? She graduated in 49. Okay. All right. 
Uh, and so she wants, she wants to go in the service and her parents are saying no, so mm -hmm. what does she do at that point? She stayed in town and she had uh, a variety of jobs. I know that she worked as a typesetter in, um, for the newspaper. Um, so she had jobs, but her sights were on getting into the service. And as soon as she turned 21, she signed up. All right, uh, and then so the, the Air Force offered her a chance to go different places and see things. Uh, yeah. Did she, uh, I suppose, I guess the opportunities were kind of limited still for what women could do in any branch of the service. Very much so, and the Air Force was a newer branch. Mm -hmm. um, it hadn't been officially recognized for quite some time. Yeah, like 1947 or something yeah. like that was when yeah. it actually broke away from the yeah. Army and became its own service branch. Mm -hmm. and, so they, and they were generally more progressive. They certainly were in terms of integration and things like that. And so they may have been a little bit more open yes. to having women do things. And yes. ultimately in the Air Force, most of you stay on the ground and they need a lot of support personnel. Right, right. All right, so uh, now what, does she, what do we know about the enlistment process or how she went about getting in? Um, that I am not sure. She states, um, let's see. How does she describe going in? Okay. Um, after thinking of nothing else since in my teens, I finally was old enough to join the Air Force in February of 52. In those days, you had to be 21 or have your parents' permission. I thought that it was very unfair, but now I see the wisdom of it. I would have done just what my parents did, and that was say no. That was a really big decision to make, and I didn't really know what it entailed. But throughout World War II, I felt I needed to do something. After a tearful goodbye at the train station in Madison, um, I and my fellow enlistees headed for Sioux Falls, where we had physicals and we took the oath of enlistment. My fellow enlistments, uh, enlistees were all men that I knew from the Madison area. Several were younger than I was, but they could enlist at 18. Uh, we were met at the train and put up at a local hotel. I had never stayed at a hotel before. She was a farm girl. And I found myself on the fourth floor all alone because she was the only woman that was uh, um, on that particular uh, train there. The men had to double up, which was good points, but I must admit I shed a tear or two. What was ahead, I really had no idea. The next morning, we went to South Dakota USA and USAF Recruiting Service Group and at the Wilson Terminal, and we got our physicals. After that, we had formal swearing in, and then we were escorted to the train station and got on a military car. I was the only woman, at least until we got to Omaha, Nebraska, when Marilyn Mickle joined us. We went to San Antonio, Texas, by way of Kansas City. We stayed on the same train all the way, picking up other men and women along the way. The women had a car to ourselves, and in no time, we seemed to pick up new recruits at every station. At San Antonio, we were picked up by military buses and were taken to Lackland Air Force Base. My life was going to change. All right. So going from not hardly ever leaving Madison to traveling completely south, mm -hmm. and she really wasn't. She really didn't know what she was getting herself into. <laughs> right, and, and she yeah. also, but she did also note in there that, uh, that, that since World War II, she had been thinking about that. Yes. And then she yeah. also points out for us that men could, needed their parents' permission when they were 17, but, but once they're 18, then they could go. Right. But, but for women, they did it differently. But for women, it was different. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, and that did she tell you anything else about either, say, the, the physical or the induction process or the train ride beyond what, what you just read? Um, it was very formal. Um, not a lot of talking and joking going on. Um, I think everybody was just trying to prepare themselves for what basic training was going to be was going to be like. Okay. And she was kind of a maverick as being, uh, well, she was the only woman until they got to um, Kansas City. To Omaha. Yeah. To Omaha, yeah. And then slowly picking up more and mm -hmm. more women. So it was um, uncharted territory. Okay. Yeah. Now what does she tell us about training? Training, oh my goodness. Um, she said, she always told me after meeting my father and marrying him, boot camp was the best thing that happened to her. Um, she was third born and very independent, very much the maverick. Um, had no problem going against the 
against the grain. And so here she is, she's in a place far away, and um, she's, she's being ordered around and she can't ask questions. Um, so as far as basic training, um, oh, let's see. Well, I mean, I, she's written her story, so I think we right. can kind of, it, so does she have, what, what does she say, I mean, after talking about getting to San Antonio, what does she put in that? Yep. Okay, we were given a nice welcome after being told to line up and something very few of us had ever done. It was the beginning of a great adventure for me. I would learn to take orders without questions, the most important thing I think I learned. Our barracks was brand new and we were the first occupants. We were then marched down to the men's mess hall. They did not have separate tables. In fact, each table had two men and two women, but you could not talk. After the first week, this rule was changed, but you are sure that you learned a lot of self-control quickly. We got our physicals and shots galore. My mom said that when she got her shots, lots of shots in both arms, she was supposed to salute for a half an hour, and that was to help with uh, not being so <laughs> sore. Um, we settled down to some serious business, not to mention a lot of marching. I couldn't understand what was so important about learning to march until later. It was discipline. Our barracks were near the men's barrack, barracks, but no fraternizing. That held up for about three weeks, and then we got to meet them. There was a building called Arnold Hall on the base, and dances were held there. My mother loved to dance. Uh, she was only five foot two, very short, and so she found out that um, dancers needed to be really tall, but she still always loved to dance. So we always hear about the dances. So dances were held there. The local gir girls came, and we thought it was unfair that we had to wear uniforms. But at least we got to wear our dress shoes and not our little Abner shoes. Those were high top leather boots, and the only ones I could get in my size were brown. I spent the whole time trying to dye them black, even the soles. Um, let's see, and then they talk about uh, there was a nice chapel near our barracks for service of all religions. Our barracks got a little landscaping while we were there, so we put a few bushes around in place and we found some white stones left over um, from the building. So in our free time, we spelled out um, our training group, which, which was the 3700 WAF training group. She was in flight 20, 222. And um, she never got to see a gun. Uh, I almost got to go for a parachute training and gas masks. I have a nice picture of myself with it on, but weather was wrong for the test and I didn't argue about it. Mostly we learned military protocol, ranks, insignias, and how to salute, and how to hurry up and wait with a smile on your face. We also got to parade just once, and I was in the back because she was the short one. Mm -hmm. They started out with the tall ones and worked their way down to us shorties. This was Armed Forces Day, May 17th, 1952. She does go on about uh, drill instructors. Mm -hmm. So our DI, the drill instructors, were tough, but they were nice, which was a different story from what I heard from my father, who was in the Marines. Mm -hmm. Sergeant King and Corporal Kabusi did a great job teaching us to work together. I made good friends there, women from all over the United States. Uh, she got to see the Alamo while she was there. Um, then it was test time. My test showed me to be a candidate for air traffic controller. They can't, Im I can't imagine why. My eyes would have gone crazy with that little screen. Fortunately, they needed teletype operators, and a group of us were transferred to Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So okay. from there she goes on to Wyoming. All right. Does she? Did she tell you anything else about uh, the, the training in San Antonio or life in San Antonio that wasn't covered here? Um, she always told me about during basic training. You had your your dresser, and everything had to be folded up perfectly in the same way, and so there were always inspections and everything was expected to be in order the same way. And she said that it was that disciplined that really helped her later on in life um, to learn how to do things correctly, not ask questions, follow orders. Okay. Did she say what happened if something was out of order? You know, she didn't. Um, 
she just always stressed that pantyhose had to be exactly this size and this side of the dresser and everything else had to be perfect. So um, my mom my mom always set a high bar for herself. Mm -hmm. And I think that she saw that as a challenge, is to, to do her best and to get as far as quickly as she could in the service. So, and she made um, sergeant within about a year, mm -hmm. so. Okay, and you, she was referring to sort of the, the, the problem of what, what kind of shoes you wore and having to wear um, your little hand. Now, at this yeah. point, uh, were they, was the uniform, did the uniform have a skirt or were they wearing slacks or we not know that? Or if there were pictures of her? The only pictures that I saw of her were the, she was wearing a skirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when she was in her, was in her dress uniform. Yeah. Okay, which is likely what you wear if you're going to the dance too. Right, right. You know, we're talking the the early fifties. Yeah. yeah. But still you, you, you can't wear a party dress or something yes. like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. But but the women that were in the service were required to wear the uniforms where women coming from off the base mm -hmm. were able to just, you know, casual. Right. Okay, all right, so let's then move on now to, to Wyoming here in Warren okay. Air Force Base. What's going on there? Okay, um, and that uh, I was really impressed with um, because here's a woman going into the Air Force and she had never flown in an airplane <laughs> before. So a uh, group of us were transferred to Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne, Cheyenne Wyoming. We flew in a DC-3 to Denver, Colorado. It was my first ride in a big airplane. All I could see were flames coming out of the engine. Later, I got to sit in the jump seat when we landed at Denver. Your first landing on that tiny little ribbon um, was very scary. I didn't believe the landing strip was wide enough until we touched down and I began to breathe again. Um, but it was a thrill I'll always remember. And she always loved to travel. She loved to fly. So we were bused to Francis E. Warren Air Force Base in Cheyenne. This was an old fort dating from the Indian Wars. We went from a new building that had four to a room to a hundred year old brick building. There were about 50 of us in one long room. They had um, coal heat and it looked like it had never been cleaned. It was a long building divided in the middle. Guys were on one side, gals on the other side with the hall doors that were sealed in between. Showers were in the basement and you also washed your clothes there. But it was not all work and no play. She had a little red-headed friend, Joy, from Georgia, who woke up one morning to snow. She had never seen snow and got so excited that she ran out, of the, uh, out the door in her pink pajamas. She laid down in the snow and th she threw snow in the air, much to the delight of the other half of the building. <laughs> they were hanging out the windows. Who would ever had had screen, window screens in the wild, wild west? So after that, then they got down to study. Um, and this was an interesting, um, like a pivotal point in, in my mom's training. She said, um, we settled down to study. Most of our class were old friends from basic training. Along the way, I caught strep throat and had to break down and just go to the sick bay. They promptly put me in the hospital. It seemed like another girl had gotten the same thing and it developed into um, rheumatic fever. So I was not allowed to even raise my head. The vampire came regularly to suck my blood. I, I recovered quite nicely, but that ended my short career in giving blood. They didn't want it anymore. Of course, I was a week behind in school. So I was rewarded with a whole new classroom of men. She was the only woman in the, mm -hmm. in the class. They knew that I was coming and they had their jackets and ties on as befitted the occasion. They weren't too thrilled as the instructor had made it clear that there would be no bad language and no um, bad jokes. There was going to be a lady present. My how times have changed. My first surprise came when the instructor called out, Tolly. Behind me, I heard a man say, here, and the place was dead quiet. I turned around and he was a very black man. My mom was very, very pale English uh, background. His name was Andy, and that had come before Evelyn in the, the roster. I just said, well, hello, cousin, and everyone let out a laugh and applauded. 
We got to be good friends the next few weeks. I really buckled down to study, as I'm sure that they thought that a woman couldn't do the work. But I did well, and I moved up to corporal from my hard work. So you were talking about uh, integration, mm -hmm. and that story just... Right. Now, so was this uh, simply a training assignment there, or was she going to actually have a regular job on that base? It was, it was, no, it was a training assignment, and then from there she was assigned to go to Washington, D.C., to the Pentagon. Okay. Uh, what else does she have to say here about uh, Wyoming? Yeah. Social life. Uh -huh. uh, so we also had a social life there. I have the matchbox covers to prove it, and no, I did not smoke. The Club Araby in Cheyenne was our favorite bar, and no, I didn't drink. But we used to gather there. We, uh, oh, once we decided it was summertime, it was May in Wyoming and the sun was warm. The group of us went to a lake and stretched out on our towels to get some sun. I fell asleep laying on my stomach, and my mother is very, very, very pale. So I got the worst sunburn ever. My back was blistered, and my friend Joy put some face cream on it, and that really set it afire. My uniform was starched, and there were some mighty uncomfortable days, but you couldn't take a day off from, the, um, from a non-military injury, so I just survived. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. My father had also written his story, and my mother really talks about the social side of it, um, the view from from being a woman, mm -hmm. as opposed to my father in the Marine, where it's, you know, what his assignments were and, mm -hmm. and how he got there and such. So. so what was she actually learning to do there? Did she, did she ever tell you anything about um, the physical to side? To tele, teletypes. She okay. learned the communications mm -hmm. uh, to reading the teletypes, which is what she ended up doing in the Pentagon. Okay. And had she known how to type before she went in? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. She learned it in high school, and then when she worked... Um, for the newspaper, okay. she also, she okay. also So she had, had some meaningful preparation yes. for doing this. That yes. probably helped with her speed and a few other things. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, did she, do we have any more about that or? No, and then, um, and then when she was done with the training there, she had a very short leave. She was able to go from Wyoming back up to Madison, South Dakota, mm -hmm. um, see family um, for a short while. And she does talk about um, she does talk about the change. Um, let's see. No, I think that's, that's when she went back again. But she had a very, very short time, mm -hmm. and she was put on a bus in uh, a train in Sioux Falls, and she made her way um, over to, to Washington, D.C., Okay. So, so now what's her next assignment? Her next assignment, um, she was uh, living on base in um, Fort Myers in mm -hmm. Arlington, uh, right next to the Arlington Cemetery. And then she was assigned to go to the Pentagon and work in the, um, the communications. And um, let's see, she does mention... I was assigned to be a tape relay center uh, as a communications specialist. I was the only one of my group to go there. Some went to Air Force Andrew, uh, Andrews Air Force oh, Base, right. um, and some were sent stateside to a station called JEZ, JEZ, um, and they had to go through JEZ to get into the JEV where I worked. And you had to pass through the security twice to get into the hall and the bathroom. Um, once I was at JEV, um, this was the overseas communication. I worked at a teletype machine. Just imagine a computer six feet wide, four feet, uh, six feet high, four feet wide, and nearly that deep. There was a keyboard, but you didn't have a screen. Everything was done on a perforated tape which you would read by knowing what series of punches meant. We could send messages about work that was, um, th and that was a printout. I got some proposals that way and a lot of nonsense, never a dull moment. In my case, the military communications were scrambled or coded. You had to have top secret clearance to work there. Can't you just see the military guy wandering around my hometown of Madison asking questions about my character? 
but I guess my character was okay and my family's too. A friend of mine was Polish and her parents were immigrants. She did not get clearance because she had so many relatives overseas that could be intimidated. Um, I loved the work, but the schedule was something else. We worked eight hour shifts for eight days, going in at 3 p.m. and getting out at 11, and then we had three days off. Then we went back on a different shift from the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Another three days off and back on the 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. shift. Fortunately, we were young and I learned to fall asleep at any time. I often had to stay late if top secret messages were coming in because I was responsible for it. My mother always told me that she was not able to talk about what she did mm -hmm. um, with her job in the Pentagon until um, until she wrote this. This is the first time that I had learned mm -hmm. what she did. In October of 52, I was made honor flight from my squadron. It came with a very nice le letter from Major Schultz. I also was selected in November, but his letter was shorter, but with the same sentiments. So she was talking about, um, she was in charge of the teletape uh, information coming in from Africa, especially. And she said that there were, uh, when the people on the other end found out there was a woman receiving it, that's when they would get, um, uh, she would, it was ticker tape that was called throwaways. And those were the proposals. Mm -hmm. And then, would you wait for me until I get back? <laughs> and, you know, six more months and I'll be coming home. Would you wait for me at the train station? So she said those were throwaways because you just got rid of them really quickly mm -hmm. so that nobody would know. But the information that she would get would be um, if someone was injured or someone was killed. And then she would have to make sure that that information was passed on to the correct um, branch of service so that families could be notified. She said it was very hard. Sometimes she would see a name that she knew. Um, and they weren't, they weren't just names. She just always thought, you know, this is somebody's brother, mm -hmm. you know, somebody's um, son. And so it always, it always affected her. Okay. Yeah. Of course, uh, I guess most of the the place where most people would be getting killed at that point would have been Korea, uh, but right. she was getting stuff from Africa. From now, Africa. Were, now were these relays via Africa that she would? So there's something from a station being sent in Africa. Yes, yeah, from a station in Africa. Yeah, yeah. but I'm not sure that we had a whole lot of personnel in Africa. Not much, no. Mm -mm. But I guess no. there were some. She had mentioned some of the places that she. Okay. You were sending messages to the guys in Africa or Korea. Okay, or Korea. Yes, uh-huh. The messages were called throwaways because mm -hmm. you wanted to get rid of them before somebody saw the message. They came from the lonely guys, and when they knew there was a girl at the other end, they were likely to propose. So. Okay, but I think then, then but we've got Korea there it, right. in, in, in the mix of things, and that's going to be where the casualties come from. Right, right. Mm -hmm. All right. So what else is she telling us about life in Washington then and what she's doing? Washington was just a wonderland for her. She came from a very small Midwestern town, you know, 4,000 people. People really didn't leave. And now she's in Washington, D.C. She's in the Air Force. And all the monuments and, you know, the government was there. And, and so when she, um, she went back she went back home and then she said that she went back to um, to Washington DC after the after her time in Cheyenne mm -hmm. she went back yeah yeah and um, she said when she first got there um, she just decided to be a tourist and she went to all the monuments she went on um, uh, did most of the monuments by herself a few mm -hmm. times she got the uh, the tours, which shows her independence. You know, she didn't, she was not, um, she was not a coward in any way. Mm -hmm. She was really on the, on the leading edge of everything. So she, um, let's see, she went to see a lot of the monuments. She said she took a picture of just about every, every monument that there was. Um, 
So I spent my first few days after reporting to work at the Pentagon as a serious tourist. I think I photographed every statue in the city, and there were a lot, and every building. The White House, the Capitol, the Washington Monument, National Gallery of Art, Jefferson Monument, even the gates to the bridge that led to the Lincoln Memorial and to Arlington Cemetery. Of course, I went to see Lee's mansion and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and I wandered through the cemetery, which was a very peaceful place. So she was, um, her barracks were on one side of the cemetery, and then my dad, actually, when he made it to Washington, D.C., he was on the other side mm -hmm. of the cemetery. All right. Now, did she say much about uh, the, the people that she worked with or the setup in her office or anything else like that? Or um, She mentioned the security. <coughs> Uh, the, the Pentagon was a huge maze, and I knew how to get to my work. But when it came to wandering the halls, I remembered the old story. There was a bird colonel that had wandered off and was never seen before, <laughs> so the rumors went. At night, we would go to the upper floor to get some food. The escalators had stopped, so you just ran up and down them. A little snack bar that we went to was not really a place to dally. The tables were little rounds that, um, that were on tall pedestals. You stood at them and ate quickly. You had been standing most of the time at work, especially when you were sending the messages to the guys in Africa or Korea. So she said that there was security. You had security going when you left your job and when you, when you came back. So um, not, not really not much except for the weird schedule that she mm -hmm. had. Um, my father, by the time they met, um, he was trying to get used to that schedule and being available when she was. Mm -hmm. He had a car and she didn't. And so he would come and pick her up, you know, in the middle of the night or whatever to make sure that, that she was safe and didn't have to take public transportation. Okay. Um, mm. So what else has she got in her story then that we haven't brought in yet? Uh, I think the... The change that went on, um, she was able to go back home um, for Christmas. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so she got there, and she said that she called her folks uh, when she got into Sioux Falls, and they came to, um, to get her. Um, it was so good to be home with family at Christmas. But afterwards, I realized that I had found a whole new life with my new friends. My old friends were still gossiping about everyone, and none seemed to aspire much except for getting married. And that was not for me. Those are famous last words. Because she, she went home at Christmas time, and at New Year's Eve, she met my father, mm -hmm. and they were married three months later. <laughs> so she broke off, uh, she permanently broke off her on again and off again boyfriend and headed back to DC. So I think she did a lot of growing. Mm -hmm. She was starting to see the world, she was recognized for the talents that she had, um, and she, she loved it. It was just her pace. It also kind of parallels what I get from a lot of male veterans, I mean, some of the Vietnam guys, and mm -hmm. certainly the, uh, both uh, men and women who've been in the service more, more recently, they talk about coming back, and you know, their friends from high school are still playing video games or they're doing whatever it was that they were yeah. doing, and now there's this whole other set of experiences that they have that yeah. these people don't understand, mm -hmm. and a whole other life that was out there. Yeah, so this is much meeting the same people thing. from all over. Um, she had mentioned that about uh, when she was down in um, at Lackland. Just she met people from Hawaii and from Georgia, and mm -hmm. and she was the only one from South Dakota. At, the only woman, but she said, you know, pe just people all over. She said the, her friend from Hawaii tried to teach her to how to hula dance, and she said she could never quite get it. She could do the dancing, but the hula was just a little bit hard for her. But she talked about her world was just opened up mm -hmm. by meeting all of these people from, you know, from all over. Do you have any sense of sort of how the people that she worked with treated her? I mean, obviously the, the major wrote good things about her or whatever. But uh, any other sense of that? Everything that I get was all respect. Mm -hmm. You know, she worked really, really hard. I think she tried to prove that a woman could do this job. And 
so, I don't know if she had that chip in her shoulder, like, you know, I, I've got to prove it or something, but everything was respectful. Mm -hmm. I never got the, the image that, um, that she was just a bauble, you know, just because she was a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, and especially at that time, I don't think they put too much value in women's service. You know, so, but she just always talked that they were all respected, mm -hmm. you know. Respectable well, it was the kind of job where the way you're describing it, you really couldn't afford to make mistakes, which you like, you can't see what you're typing. Right, instance. yeah. Uh, and, and so getting yeah. it right and getting it right matters. So if yeah. you've got somebody in there who's going in and getting it right, anybody who's in charge of that might be very happy. Yeah. Hence the promotion. And she sergeant. did make the, the honor flight mm -hmm. um, and making sergeant very quickly. Mm -hmm. She was very pleased with that, yeah, and I, I've got a feeling my, my grandparents were probably very fearful, you know, that she's going off into this big world, and, but she was doing really well. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so now we've gotten to the point in her story here where she's gone home for Christmas, uh, and now she comes back. Yes, yeah, so she, she had just gotten back, um, and it was right after Christmas, mm -hmm. and um, she, she was told by her friends, you know, you get lonely or something, we can go out and do something. So um, this is where her life really changes if it hadn't changed uh, before. So, um, okay. I had lots of time, leave time, so I went home for Christmas. Um, when she came back, <clears throat> oh, this is how she right before she went back, um, she was told that if she wore her uniform and she went to the train station or the bus station, uh, if they had room, they would let her on. Well, she didn't get on, she didn't get on, there were higher ranking people. So she finally came back to the base and um, she still had her uniform, uniform on. So her friends were going up to he Marine headquarters and I was on the other side of Arlington Cemetery from Fort Myer. I went along, uniform and all. I imagine that I stood out a bit at the slop shoot, which was the name of the NCO there. But I had a good time and then hopped on a bus over to Andrew's base again. I wasn't the only one waiting. Finally, there was one other guy that said that if we chipped in on gas, he would drive all the way to, um, to, the, to the west. He lived in Oklahoma. So there were six of us, two guys and four girls, and it was a wild trip. Heavy, heavy snows, storms all the way. Dropped one girl off at Indiana, and then I left in Kansas City for the train station. So she went home. She realized the changes, broke it off with her uh, on again, off again boyfriend. And um, so her parents sent her um, on a uh, on a train back to to Washington. So I got in on New Year's Eve and some of my Marine friends said that if I got lonely for them to head back to DC. So my um, WAF friends and I headed out to the slop shoot and we, too, we were going to celebrate New Year's Eve. My good friend Whitey came in with a guy. I had never seen him before but apparently he had seen me because he had seen her before Christmas mm -hmm. when she was trying to head out. My notorious trip to the Marine Bar with the Air Force uniform was apparently made a good impression, and now I'm glad that I did it. Whitey's friend was called Buck Buckingham. Family called him Dick, but his Marine buddies called him Buck, and I was impressed with this man. I had not slept for a long time, so I think I wasn't really a ball of fire, but I had a good time, but that was just the beginning. So Buck called the next day, and I think uh, mental te telepathy had something to do with that. She was probably sitting in her barracks hoping that he would call. And then life was a whirlwind. In January, he drove the float for Michigan, his home state, in the inaugural parade for Eisenhower, uh, who was elected president. He looked great in his dress blue uniform, but the collar emblem literally wore a hole in his neck. Because I worked multiple shifts, Buck would pick me up at work. He worked days, so the schedule was getting pretty rough on him. His commanding officer suggested that he should just marry me so that the young Marine could get some sleep, and he did. 
He proposed at Great Falls, Virginia in February of 53. A group of us requisitioned some chicken and some tools from the mess hall and we had a picnic in February. We were married in March of 1953 in the church in, Harl in Arlington and I lived off base. I made sergeant in April of 53. I then got a medical discharge because I was pregnant with my first child, Bruce. And so ended an exciting life um, in the Air Force. And I went on to have an even more exciting life being married to Buck. So um, at that time, if you became pregnant, you got an honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. So my mom said that um, she tried hiding the pregnancy for, for quite a while. And she said, finally, being nauseous and mm -hmm. not feeling well and starting to show. And she said then they, you know, they gave her the honorable discharge. But she said it was really hard. She really wanted to continue on and she loved what she, she loved what she did. So yes, this is well before the era of pregnancy uniforms and a lot of other right, things like that, which right. they have now. And it's interesting that both my mom and my dad were in the service when they got married, but they decided to not wear their uniforms for their wedding. Mm -hmm. And I've asked several times, you know, but you were in the service, wouldn't that be, you know, great? And they said that they wanted the wedding to be separate from the service, so that when they looked back at the pictures, they would see. The wedding rather than oh we were just in the service okay now uh, did she tell any uh, other stories about life in Washington or stuff that she did there and then I got that uh, haven't been covered here of her time in the service yeah um, she did mention that when she decided that she was going to marry my dad and she sat down with her commanding officer and she said that he he first had that commanding officer, you know, asking questions, and then he turned into that dad figure. Are you sure you want to marry this man? You've not known him for very long. Your lives are very, very different. My mother came from a very, very small town, mm -hmm. farm girl, didn't really travel much. Um, she was third born out of four kids. My father grew up in Detroit, mm -hmm. a very, you know, busy place. Um, he was the oldest of three boys. And to have these two people come from such diverse backgrounds, to meet in Washington on New Year's Eve, uh, married three months later. And uh, when my mom passed away, they were almost married 60 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I think a lot of it has that because of the military training that they had was to uh, that discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, that working together, it's right. a team, and they were always a team. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Now, did uh, she work at all out, outside the home after they were married, or did she? No. My brother Bruce came along nine months after, mm -hmm. after they got married, and then they moved back to Detroit because um, my dad had an opportunity for a job there. And then I came along, and mm -hmm. then my younger brother. So my mom, uh, she didn't work outside the home. She worked hard enough inside mm -hmm. the home. But she was always on that cutting edge. She was the mom that was skateboarding when skateboards first came out. <laughs> <laughs> she was the mom that had a computer before the rest of us had a computer because she was so, she just loved being on the edge. She loved mm -hmm. being different. She loved, uh, she loved being independent and she was very, very involved um, as a mom. And it was, she kind of showed us how to think outside of the box and to always not be afraid to step out and do something different. Okay. And so then, sort of, you know, where then, then, we've said a little bit about this, but it's kind of a good way to close out here. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, how do you think that military experience affected her? How did it help shape her? I think it opened her world, going from a very, very small farm community to seeing huge cities, being involved in the Pentagon, um, meeting important people, people seeing her worth. Um, 
I told you that she was five foot two. Mm -hmm. She always told me TNT comes in small packages, <laughs> and that was her. She was she was always on the cutting edge of, of doing things. I think um, the discipline, you know, that she learned in in basic training. Um, in our home, my dad was very much the the more stricter you know, parent, mm -hmm. but my mom still expected big things of us. Um, so she, she also, you know, had that discipline too. I think it just opened her world mm -hmm. and it was something that she was always able to say with pride, you know, that she was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, obviously my dad would get recognition because he was, he was a Marine, he was a man. Mm -hmm. um, but he was always the first one to point out that my mom made sergeant before he did. So it was something that he was very, very proud of too. All right. Yeah. Well, it makes for a unique story. So thank you very much for coming on in and thank you very much. Thank you.